This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The book of Revelation at last comes to a close with chapter 22. We have seen through the course of this study that the lesson that has been given is that we should overcome. And the message has been communicated through the effort to the seven churches of Asia, admonishing them in a time of serious persecution to be faithful. We have seen that many, many thousands of them did even unto death. And so, through the course of our study, we have seen that they overcame. We should be in a position to overcome the world also, based upon their example, their following of the Bible, and the admonition that comes down to us today in the form of God's revelation, the inspired Word of God, and the victorious nature and character of the great and final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In chapter 22 today, we come to the last chapter of it, where we're going to see within it final attestations. You know, we have a very formal presentation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ in the beginning to his servant John, to the seven churches of Asia. We see the one who is addressing those in Asia Minor through the apostle John. This message was delivered through a man who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He had been with Jesus Christ during his personal ministry. In 1 John 1, 1 through 4, he tells about being in physical contact with Jesus Christ as an eyewitness. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, placed the apostle John along with the other apostles in seeing and knowing Jesus Christ personally. We have also seen regarding John that he has written four other books of the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And now then he writes the book of Revelation. With this, we have then an eyewitness, a close partner with Jesus Christ during his personal ministry, the disciple of love, as he is often referred to, communicating this message to those in Asia Minor. We have no way of knowing for certain, but history tells us that the Apostle John lived to advanced age, that after he was exiled to Patmos, that he was able to return to Ephesus, where he served as an elder in the Lord's church. And history, tradition has it, that John would often have to be carried to the services of the church. He would rise on one elbow, and he would say to the churches, my little children love one another. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly characteristic of the aged Apostle John. If the book of Revelation is written in AD 96, he lived to be an old man. John has communicated the message and done the job that the Lord wanted him to do. Surely across the first three centuries, the message of the book of Revelation would have been something that brethren everywhere would have appreciated having. Notice from the Lord that the cause in which they were involved was ultimately and finally going to be victorious. We have, through the course of our time together, gone to Revelation 11, verse 15, many times, suggesting to you that it is a key that will unlock the meaning to the whole book. It comes at a time when the seventh angel sounds with an announcement saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That is a principle that has been true. We've noted many passages of Scripture, for example, Daniel 4, 34, and 35, telling us that God is in control. We saw in Revelation 19, 6, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He reigns and He will always reign. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Many, many times we have gone to Daniel 2 at verse 44 for the purpose not only of showing you the timing of the establishment of the kingdom, but also of the encouragement that we can receive from that passage in knowing that the kingdom of Christ would stand forever. It would never be destroyed, but it would break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. When Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. In Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18, he was speaking of that kingdom in long-anticipated fulfillment from Old Testament times. 
verses like Isaiah 11, Isaiah 9, verse 6, and many others, where a new law would be issuing forth from the city of Jerusalem in the last days, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The one who was born in Bethlehem of, Ephra of Ephrathah, whose goings forth had been from old, from everlasting, Micah 5, 2, would establish his church after his death, burial, and triumphant resurrection on the first day of the week. He ascended back to God the Father and sent the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, for the purpose of guiding the apostles into all truth, John 16, at verse 7. They began to do that when they were empowered with the Spirit from on high in Acts 2 and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit moved their tongues to communicate the glorious gospel message in its fullness for the first time, urging men and women to realize that the stem and offspring of David, Jesus the Christ, was the one who had been raised from the dead to sit on David's throne where he would rule his people over his kingdom. And his kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Friends, as the church was expanded in the first century, covered in the book of Acts for us, so that it is stated to us that the closing chapter of the book, Paul was preaching things concerning the kingdom of God, no man forbidding him. Even so, may we today hope for the same results that they enjoyed, as stated in Colossians 1 and verse 23, that every creature which is under heaven had heard the gospel. May we, with all the fiber of our being, strive to do whatever we can to get the good news of the gospel to a lost and dying world. It is a valid charge. It is a worthwhile endeavor. It holds for us the hope of the ages. We are able to enjoy fellowship with those of like-minded nature who want to do the will of the living God who ultimately, upon life's way finally coming to a close, hearing the Master say in the judgment, well done, good and faithful servant, will be entered into that final city, the city of heaven, where all tears will be wiped away and we'll be in fellowship with God and we will see his face. What a wonderful notion that is, that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is an everlasting message and his kingdom one that will never, ever end. Aren't you thankful that Jesus gave us a written invitation? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11:28 through 30. We obey the gospel of the Son of God by doing what Jesus said. Hear what Christ said in regard to this invitation. He said, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. He said in verse 21, If ye believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins, and where I am, ye cannot come. He stated it clearly in Luke 13, verse 3. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then he gave the affirmation in Matthew chapter 10 at verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men... Him will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. He made it plain that if we would not confess Him in this sinful and adulterous generation, He would deny us when He returns with His holy angels to this earth to destroy it and to take His redeemed home. Mark chapter 8 at verse 38. Then we must be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Again, hear what Jesus said on the matter. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Also, he said, Go and preach the gospel to the whole world. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Repentance and remission of sins were to be preached beginning at Jerusalem. Luke chapter 24 verse 46 to 48. That's exactly what happened. And in Acts chapter 2, those who gladly received that message were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 41. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2, 47. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we urge you to do that. That's what the Bible teaches. You've seen what Jesus says, and you can live with the Christian's hope. If you'll be faithful unto death, 
the crown of life will be yours. Revelation 2 and 10. What I'd like us to do as we begin our study of this last chapter of the Bible today is to go over the outline that we have presented from its beginning. We've noticed that there are two outlines that we're suggesting. One of them is found in Revelation 1.19 where John is instructed to write the things that he has seen and that would be chapters 1 through chapter 5. The things which are, that would be chapter 6 through 18. And the things which shall be hereafter, that would be chapters 19 to 22. We've also given an outline that comes from the book where you begin with the seven churches of Asia, letters to seven churches. We've read through those letters. We've ex discussed and explained those letters. And then we find after that that there's a book with seven seals that is presented at the throne of God and Christ alone is found worthy to take that book with seven seals. Each of those seals are opened in turn, revealing more of the message of the book. Finally, with the opening of the seventh seal, there is the seven trumpets, and those seven trumpets blast judgment upon the earth, culminating with the seven trum seventh trumpet and the key passage of the book in chapter 11, 15. But also, with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we saw there were seven angels in heaven given seven bowls of wrath, and these were poured out on the earth. And we saw that section in the book of Revelation. And then following that, the finale of the book, chapters 19 to 22. What we'd like to do now is just take a look on the screen at this material and just read down through each of these chapters and its contents so that as we close, we can have all of that material in mind. Let's do that now. The book of Revelation, the seven churches, chapters 1 to 4. John is exiled to Patmos. Chapter 2, four letters to churches. Chapter 3, three letters to churches. Chapter 4, God on His throne. Then the second section of the book, the book with seven seals. In chapter 5, Christ alone is worthy to take the book with seven seals. In chapter 6, six seals are open. In chapter 7, the sealing of God's saints. In chapter 8, the seventh seal reveals seven trumpets. And then the third section in the book, the seven trumpets. In chapter 9, the fifth and sixth trumpet sounds. The other four were sounded earlier in chapter 8. In chapter 10, the little book. In chapter 11, the seventh trumpet sounds the victory of Christ. In the twelfth chapter, the great red dragon attacks Christ, and he's identified as the devil in chapter 12, verse 9. In chapter 13, the mark of the beast, the number 666, the number of a man, and we saw who that was. Chapter 14, the hour of God's judgment at last has come. Observe that God's judgment comes in an hour. And that point is repeatedly made in that chapter and elsewhere. Then moving to the seven bowls of wrath. In chapter 15, seven angels are given seven bowls of wrath. In chapter 16, the seven bowls of wrath are poured out. In chapter 17, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is described and presented. In chapter 18, we see the fall of Babylon the Great. And then the finale of the book, the last four chapters, the army of God is victorious. The devil's doom in chapter 20. Chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth. In chapter 22, a further description of heaven. We wanted to read through the overall contents of the book for your edification and for summary and review. It's been a joy to be presenting this material. Now let's go to chapter 22 and see the closing chapter, not only in the book of Revelation, but the closing chapter in all of God's Word. Again, we would like to seek the device of using first century glasses to read this chapter, remembering all that has been said up to this point, to think about it as if we were there in the first century and what it would mean to us then to see what it should mean to us today. In Revelation 22 at verse 1 we read, And he showed me a river pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he saith unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. 
Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I, heard and, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that, is un, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This final chapter in the book has its attestations. That is, the ones who are attesting to the book, and they are threefold. First, you'll notice that there is the angel. Those things, the, John saw those things and heard them. The angel saw those things, and Jesus Christ attests to that book. So you have an angel, you have John, and you have Jesus Christ making attestations to this book. When John saw and heard, he fell down to worship at the feet of the angel that showed these things. He's told to get up. He cannot accept, that angel cannot accept his worship. But then John also is giving his affirmation to these things. Now look at verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. There you have the attestations to the book coming from our Lord, from John, and from the angel in this chapter. Also going back to the beginning of the chapter, we have the content of the chapter once again to reflect our thoughts on heaven itself, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. We've called attention to that pure river of water of life as pure as crystal. We've seen that it is like glass, and we have underscored the tranquility that might be indicated by such a presentation. Heaven is a place of perfect peace. Remember in chapter 4 when we saw the throne of God presented? Well, that's what we saw at that time, a place of tranquility and peace. Also then in verse 2, in the midst of the street and on either side of it, the tree of life. Remember how we have spoken concerning that which was lost in the garden is regained in Revelation? We have seen that there was a river that was in Egypt, rather in Eden, and this river was flowing for the benefit of Adam and Eve, the residents of paradise. Now then we see that that had the tree of life where they could eat and live forever if they would remain faithful to God. Well here, the tree of life reappears in heaven. It is a fruitful tree bearing 12 manner of fruit. It bears those fruits every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The nations had been wounded and suffered much through what they had endured for the cause of Christ and to stand for God. But now, here you'll find them being healed in the tree of life there. Verse 3, there's no more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb are in it, and His servants shall serve Him. We've seen that there's no temple in heaven because God is that temple. We're made to understand that today because the church is the temple of Christ today, according to Ephesians 2.21. There's not a physical temple like you had in the Old Testament. It is rather a spiritual abode. The Lord dwells in His people. We are living stones built up 
that holy priesthood today. Even so in heaven, there's no physical temple. God himself and Jesus Christ make up that temple. And then he tells us what we'll be doing in heaven. His servants shall serve him. You remember way back in the Garden of Eden, they were instructed to dress and keep it. There was activity and industry in the Garden of Eden. Even in paradise, there's activity. Maybe sometimes people think about heaven as a place where you don't have anything to do. No, there's activity and industry there because in heaven, his servants will serve him. We admit not to knowing the full extent of in what way we will serve him. That's why while we're here, when there is service that we can render, we want to jump to the task. Whatever we know to be doing, we want to get to doing it. We want to learn how to be his servant here so that when we get to heaven and we're asked to serve in some way, perhaps in which we've never served before, we'll be equipped through experience and dedication on our part to serve him because there we will serve him day and night in his temple forever and ever. We are confident that that service also involves worshiping God, being about his throne and being able to see him face to face even as we see further. Verse 5, there shall be no night there. We called attention to that light last time. No need to fear the darkness because there's no night there. They neither need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. There is the terminating point of the soul in heaven forever and ever. I like the imagery that's used back in chapter 3, verse 12, when uh, here... The Apostle John is writing the words of Christ and he is urging them to overcome. And if they would overcome, they'd be like a pillar in the temple of our God and they shall go no more out. Heaven is the permanent home of the soul. will reign forever and ever. In verse 6, And he said unto me, these, thing, these sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. Again, in order to appreciate this book like we need to, to have the opportunity to understand it, we must be able to see that in the beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, and at the end in chapter 22, verse 6, these things must shortly be done. In other words, they would have meaning and application to the seven churches of Asia that received these initial letters. Also, this angel is the one who's giving the attestation that we mentioned just a moment ago. He says in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Again, a blessing in the book. We've seen in the opening chapter, a blessing for reading it. Now then we see at the end of the book, a blessing for keeping the sayings of this book. That's why throughout our study, we have urged you not to accept the doctrines of men that di distract from the prophecy of this book. There have been a lot of people across time who want to present themselves as prophets, and they are false prophets. They've been, there have been false prophets in every age of man. There were false prophets in the days of Christ. There were false prophets in the days in which these people received this message. Remember the church at Ephesus? They were commended for trying those who said they were apostles and are not, and has found them to be liars. Well, you have false prophets even in our day, people who are charlatans and mercenary, who are drawing upon the sensitivities of people who long for heaven, trying to give them fanciful schemes and theories, depending upon them for intricacies of those plots and schemes so that they can have some kind of reassurance. No, blessed is the one who reads. And here, blessed is the ones that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We don't need another book. We have this book. And through reading it and studying it, we will be in a position to appreciate the blessings that it contains. Verse 8, John says, And I saw these things and heard them. And when I, heard, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then he said to me, See thou do it not? For I am, of, or I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. God is the true object of our worship. He is seeking men's worship today. John chapter 4 verse 23. And men must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4 24. A good question to ask is, is my worship unto God today in truth? The Bible is truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17 17. Now, if my worship is in truth, I can go in the truth and find my worship. When I go in truth to find worship, I can find in the covenant age in which we live today, the New Testament, I can find five and only five items or avenues of worship. 
avenues of adoration. They consist of prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, singing, Ephesians 5, verse 19, without instrumental music. It's singing and making melody. He told us where to make the melody. Question, on a keyboard or in the heart? Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19. The contents would be psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Then we have the avenue of preaching or teaching, 2 Timothy chapter 4 at verse 2. On the first day of the week, we are instructed to observe the Lord's Supper after the manner described in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three and following. And it is upon the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7 instructs, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. And then the fifth and final item of worship that we find in truth is the giving of our means. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, And as I have given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now there, your worship is in truth when you do those things. Well, what about the preaching? What's to be preached? Preach the word, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. The preacher should be standing up with the Bible open, declaring its contents. Well, what about a woman preacher? Is it all right if my wife wants to get up and preach a sermon? No, it is not all right. The Bible says concerning prayer, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's in 1 Timothy 2.12. And also it says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority or have authority over the man. She is to be in silence and in subjection. That's the Lord's teaching on that. That's not to say that men are smarter than women. Most of us men already are ready to admit that, especially if you've been around as many women as I have, raised in a house full of them. I have a lovely wife now. Oh yes, we're not saying that we're smarter than anybody. We're saying we're in submission to the Savior. And godly women recognize that principle and they want to honor it too by allowing the men to take the lead in that preaching. So the Word of God is to be preached and a wise scribe brings out of his treasure things old and new. Matthew chapter 13 verse 52. Studying Old and New Testaments, presenting the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 at verse 28, commended to the Word of God that's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified through faith which is in Christ Jesus, Acts chapter 20 verse 32. So there you'll have the worship that is in truth and the admonition of the angel here in verse 9, worship God. Well, that's how you do it. You worship God in truth. And it's always that way. You don't ever stray from that and say, we'll worship him in truth today, but tomorrow we're going to get a rock band in here and get it kicking. No. To worship him in truth is what we must do every time we worship him. That honors and pleases God. Any human activities like that that are designed to evoke entertainment or excitement, and that is the motivator. For, no, no, no. That's not to be done. We're to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We need to heed the admonition, I think, of Ecclesiastes 5.1, which says when we enter into the presence of God, we should be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. It requires reverence in worshiping God. And then notice with me, if you will, next, in the passage, after he says, worship God, in verse 10, he says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Remember back earlier when John heard the thunderings? This was back in the 10th chapter with the episode with the little book. He's ready to write it down and tell what, the, what it said. And he was told, seal that up and don't write it. Remember that we used on that occasion, that is an opportunity to say. The book of Revelation itself teaches that we're not supposed to know what everything in it means. If we were, John would not be told, seal that up and don't write that down. Do you know what those thunders meant? I don't. Nobody does. Why not? John sealed them up so that no one would know that. God didn't want him to know it. God doesn't want us to know everything. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 29 at verse 29. Well, here John is told, don't seal this up. You get this message out. The prophecy of this book needs to be gotten out because the time is at hand. Then in verse 11 he says, I call this the still passage. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. If on the one hand a person wants to be unrighteous, if he wants to be ungodly, as we have seen, there's, there are some people that will not repent. No matter what happens, they will not repent. They are not drawn to repentance through 
the love and mercy and kindness of God, as Romans 2, 4 says, nor are they drawn to repentance by the judgment of God, as we've seen replete examples of here in the book of Revelation. Well, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. That does not invalidate the teaching of the Bible just because there are men who will not heed its loving message. Then he says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And that goes to our faithfulness. Then in verse 12, he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now you notice here that we need to be working as Christians. Anytime you mention that today, you've got a group of folks religiously who will jump up and say, well, that's, that's working out your salvation. That's works of human merit. No, it is humble, submissive acts of obedience to God. And if we don't have any works, then we're not going to be rewarded because our reward is according to our works. Remember in Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We need to be active. Remember in James 1.18, how James said, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. We need to be demonstrating those things. What's Hebrews 11 about? It is about great people of faith. And it says they did something. In every instance, faith found action. Well, that's what's being mentioned here. His reward is according as his work shall be. We need to be praying that we can be worn out in the service of God, never rusting out through disuse, but wear us out in the Lord's service. I have seen the old plows that the farmers run through the fields. They'll sit up all winter. They'll get rusty. But you let springtime come and they can get back out in the fields with those. And as they go pulling them through the dirt, they'll be shiny as silver. You know why? They're in active use. We hope that the Lord will shine us up as he uses us in his service to his glory. He's going to reward us accordingly. In verse 13, again, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. We must do his commandments. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you, John 15, 14. And then in verse 15, he reminds that on the other hand, outside, outside of the will of God, outside of the church, for without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers and murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth, and maketh alive. What do you want to be out there for? Get in with the redeemed in the church of Christ. Let the Lord add you to his church and be among the saved. Then in verse 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. See, he's still talking about the churches in this passage of Scripture. The churches mentioned at the beginning are now being addressed at the end. Those enemies of truth that we have been exposing throughout our study, while they have said before, why there's no church mentioned after 322 in the book. Oh, yes, there is. He was writing to those churches all through that book. The letters in the opening two, two to three chapters of the book there were given for the purpose of specifying those seven churches of Asia and dealing directly and immediately with concerns that they had to both encourage and admonish them to repent where they needed to and to continue to be steadfast in God's service. Here he continues to write to the churches and to testify these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then this book concludes with an invitation. The invitation is, and the spirit and the bride say come, and let him that heareth say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. I learned a lesson a long time ago from an African-American evangelist. He said, when asked, how is it that you baptized 100 people last year? He said, I have some keys that I use. One of them is an invitation. And he explained. He said, I go visit somebody in the hospital. I say, I hope that they'll get well. I ask if you'd like for us to have prayer before our Heavenly Father. They say, yes, we pray. And then they may say, you know, I'd like for you to come see me once I get home. He said, they just gave me a key right there. They gave me an invitation. He said, now then, when they get out of the hospital and I go to their home, I can sit down and study with them. Nobody can throw me out. I got in there based on an invitation. They're not going to say, what are you doing here? I was invited. That is a key. I thought, there's a stroke of genius, the power of an invitation. Well, in order for us to really believe that we can come to God, we must be invited. The power of an invitation to you and me is extended right here. When the Spirit and the bride say what? They say, come. Let him that hear us say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. 
So there is an invitation at the close of this book, a final invitation. Here the Bible is closing out the revelation of God to man for all time. And God has chosen the last thing that he says to humanity here is an invitation. These are the last words of the Apostle John. And in the last closing statements that he has to make in his life that are permanently recorded and preserved for us, he wants to extend heaven's invitation. And in so doing, he invites all people to come to Christ in submissive obedience. And then the Word of God concludes also with a warning in verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So here you have the prohibition against taking from or adding to what you've got here. You cannot supplement or augment the teaching of Scripture. It is now codified. We have the canon of Scripture, the rule or the standard of Scripture. And we have it in 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. And then he closes with this admonition. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And then this response from humanity. Even so... Come, Lord Jesus. And then the final words of the book that are very common in the New Testament, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And there are the final words of the living God to man involve the subject of God's unmerited favor to man. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And then the word amen. You know what that is? That's the last word. That's it. That's the final statement of all of God's Word entirely, and of the book of Revelation specifically. We certainly have enjoyed this study of the book, and we appreciate everyone who's made it possible. Our prayer is for the continued good work of everyone involved, and that God will bless us with peace and prosperity in this life, that we might expand the borders of His kingdom to a lost and dying world and remain true and faithful ourselves. And our hope for you as you are watching this message is that you will know the love of God that you'll be able to see that we can learn from God and that we will receive the legacy that the Lord has presented to us in His Word, which tells us the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever.